Um, so thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're really delighted to see such a range of different professions all um, interested in the topic. Um, we, I can see from the registration details that we've got a lot of architects in the rooms, um, project managers, surveyors and engineers. But also it's great to see um, an audience from people who work in schools, so um, governors and school business managers. So thank you. It's wonderful to see um, so many people with um, an interest in the topic. Um, so um, I'll just introduce briefly the Low Carbon Devon project. Um, so we are a European regional funded um, project based at the University of Plymouth. Um, we're here to support Devon-based enterprises um, take action on climate change and transition to a low carbon economy. Um, so we do this uh, for a number of ways through events such as these, which are um, always um, business focused, free events um, on a whole range of um, really different topics. Um, we also have fully funded internships that so we place students in Devon Enterprises to um, take on a low carbon project. And um, we're here in a, in a wider sense to connect Devon Enterprises with the research um, at the University of Plymouth to, um, to help them with um, low carbon ideas and low carbon projects. So I'll put um, a link to the project in the chat for those of you who are from Devon Enterprises and can learn a little bit more about what we do and how we might be able to support you. Um, but today we are excited to hear from Dr. Sepeda Korsavai uh, present her findings on how the design of schools can optimise indoor environmental quality whilst lowering the carbon footprint and energy bills for schools. Um, Dr. Korsavai is uh, the Low Carbon Devon Project's Industrial Research Fellow for Energy Efficient Buildings. Her research explores how buildings can be designed to mitigate climate change by reducing energy consumption and carbon emissions in buildings whilst improving different aspects of indoor environmental quality. The results of her research on indoor environmental quality in schools are based on data collected for her PhD in Architectural Sciences and Built Environment, which has been peer reviewed by experts in the field. And the content is being published within scientific journals. This data in schools was collected over the course of a year with two years of data analysis. Uh, we'll also hear later from Jack Fleming, Associate Director at Hydrock, and Ryan Morton, Principal Mechanical Engineer with Hydrock. So we're really grateful to have their practical knowledge to complement Sepheda's research findings today. Um, so I'm delighted. Oh, I must mention as well. Please do um, put any questions that you have in the chat throughout the event. There'll be a Q and A section at the end. Um, so anything that springs to mind, do pop that in the chat, and we'll try to get to it. Um, and. We are delighted to hand over now to Dr. Sepeda Korsavai to tell us about her research. Hi everyone, thank you Rosie. Um, I share my screen. Well, thank you so much for attending the event. Um, my name is Sepide and I'm the research fellow on energy efficient buildings working on low carbon Devon projects. Today I'd like to talk about the design of schools in relation to indoor environmental quality. Um, I would start with an introduction to highlight the importance of the study and its significance uh, and then move on to methodology, findings and most importantly uh, recommendations that are based on the findings. Um, recommendations are categorized into three main groups for school designers, for schools maintenance team, and teachers and the students. Um, well, with the spread of COVID, uh, the importance of indoor air quality and ventilation rates becomes even more important um, in um, schools post pandemic. Uh, also, according to SIPSI, it's important to increase ventilation rates and reduce the risk of spreading COVID in buildings. On the other hand, uh, so many studies have focused on the importance of indoor environmental quality 
on students' learning, overall comfort, their productivity, and their tiredness level. Um, therefore, this is something that needs to be dealt with. Um, and the space heating makes up for the largest proportion of energy use in buildings and its associated costs. So it's important to reduce space heating as well in schools. Uh, the study was uh, conducted in 32 naturally ventilated classrooms in eight primary schools during non-heating and heating seasons for one full year. Uh, nine to 11 years old children were targeted for the study and environmental variables, including indoor and outdoor variables, indoor temperature, outdoor temperature, humidity, air speed, CO2 level, and light level were recorded at five minutes intervals. Also observation forms were recorded um, uh, uh, were, uh, were recording the status of controls. Questionnaires were filled out by children and time-lapse cameras were controlling the status of controls such as windows and blinds. Um, findings. One of the most important findings of the study was uh, the difference between children's uh, comfort temperature and adults' comfort temperature. So children's comfort temperature was um, around 1.9 degrees cooler than um, adults comfort temperature, the one predicted by EN 15251. It was 20.9, and if we consider category one for children, for sensitive and vulnerable groups, this limit would be around 18.2 to 22.2 for non-heating season. And also if we consider category two, for normal expectations in new or renovated buildings, this uh, range would be 17.2 until 23.2 degrees. However, the uh, thermal comfort temperature was even lower during heating season. It was 20.2 degrees, which is 2.8 cooler than comfort temperature predicted um, for adults by EN. But why it is uh, like that? Why children have a lower thermal comfort temperature? Uh, there are several reasons that can be explained. Um, but one of the reasons is children have a higher surface area to mass ratio and they have a higher uh, rate of heat absorption or loss. Also, children have a higher metabolic rate per body weight and they have a lower sweating rate. Also, we, the findings show that uh, comfort temperature was lower during heating season than non-heating season. It's mainly because children's increased practice of personal adaptive behaviors, such as uh, drinking water, um, changing uh, clothing value, it actually increased their thermal comfort temperature. And during non-heating season, they are more exposed to, in more, uh, to environmental conditions. Um, another finding that can be discussed is regarding window opening temperature. As you can see in this picture, window opening temperature, the orange dots are higher than the green ones, children's thermal comfort temperature. And the study showed that for, sorry, uh, for 90, 7% of the cases during non-heating season and 80% of the time during heating season, window opening temperature was higher than children's thermal comfort temperature. And this difference could be, uh, the difference between window opening temperature and children's thermal comfort temperature could be more than two degrees in more than half of the time. There are several reasons that can be explained. And one of them is because classrooms are mainly controlled by teachers who have a higher thermal comfort temperature and children's reaction to the rise of temperature is a slower than that for adults as children are less sensitive to temperature changes. And also uh, opportunities for practicing um, effective environmental adaptive behaviors are limited for children according to the controls that they are designed for them. And teachers usually do not encourage children to engage in environmental adaptive behaviors and they're not fully aware of the differences that they have with children in terms of thermal environments. As you can see in these two control logic diagrams for windows and blind operations, it's important to consider the factors that limit windows operations and blinds operations in the schools because these factors can give us recommendations on how to design windows and controls so that operations are not limited. As you can see in the first graph, factors such as noise level, wind, um, rain or snow when the window is open, and departure from the classroom were factors that were observed that would limit operations on controls such as windows, 
and also factors such as glare on the desk, um, if students are watching a documentary or news, and also departure from the classroom are the factors that caused blinds closing. One of the important factors that were um, that needs to be improved in the schools in indoor is indoor air quality and ventilation rates. However, to look into ventilation rates and look indoor air quality, we need to consider all the occupant related factors, building related factors and contextual factors that can affect ventilation rates. In this study, I categorized all of the classrooms into four categories, classrooms with high potentials for providing ventilation rates and good practice of occupants, classrooms that provide high potentials for, uh, for ventilation rates, so the classrooms that are designed um, and the controls are designed in a way that they can provide adequate ventilation rates, and uh, classrooms with low potentials, good practice, low potentials, and poor practice. Technically, good practice refers to when occupants operate available controls efficiently to maintain adequate ventilation rates. And poor practice refers to when occupants do not operate adequate ventilation rates. As you can see in this graph, the mean and median values of the ventilation rates are the highest when there is high practice, there's a high potentials, uh, for ventilation rates, and there's a good practice of occupants. But surprisingly, the second favorable group in terms of ventilation rates is a group that provides low, low potentials for ventilation rates and good practice. It means that uh, operation on controls is as important as the design of controls. So in, in schools and classrooms that occupants used all the potentials and operated the windows efficiently, ventilation rates were higher. Another interesting finding is the relationship between open area and ventilation rates. These two have a significantly important relationship with each other. And it's important to see how for one amount of ventilation rate, which is for example, eight liter per second per person during non-heating and heating seasons, the average open area can be different during both seasons. So my study showed that uh, for non-heating season, we need like 3.8 square meter of open area to provide that level of ventilation rate and two square meter of open area during heating season. But why is that? Why do we need a lower amount of opening, the same, uh, the lower amount of um, openings for the same amount of ventilation rate during heating season? One of the reasons can be um, related to the air dis density differences. Well, cold winter air is denser than warmer summer air and high temperature um, takes more volume compared to low temperature. Another reason that can be explained, which is more important, and that's the main reason, is the difference between inside and outside. The higher temperature difference between inside and outside during heating season creates a higher exchange rate in a way that in single-sided classrooms where, where cool outdoor air enters the room through the lower parts of the windows and warmer air is exchanged and, and um, is exchanged with warm air that escapes through the upper part of the windows. So in my study, the same opening could provide an airflow rate of 1,150 cubic meter per hour during non-heating season and 1,852 cubic meter per hour during heating season, which is actually good news for designers because during heating season, for with having a smaller amount of opening, having it open for a shorter period of time, we can have a bigger amount of airflow rates and increase ventilation rates and improve indoor air quality. Another important aspect that needs to be addressed is occupancy density. So occupancy density is defined as the area per number of occupants or the volume per number of occupants. However, occupancy density in classrooms is much higher than that in office buildings because the students sit very close to each other. My studies show that to have CO2 level of 1000 ppm, which is the minimum that we would need for indoor air quality in the classroom, we need occupancy density of 2.3 uh, cubic um, square meter per person and 7.6 cubic meter per person. These numbers are very important because they give us recommendations in terms of area and volume and the height for the design of schools. 
um, the most interesting part, which is the recommendations to show really the practical application of this research for school designers, for school maintenance team, and for school occupants. So um, in terms of uh, the classroom and schools, it's really important that designers consider the location of the school in areas where the operation is not limited due to high background noise level or pollution level. These two factors were observed in my study that um, restricted windows operations and occupants would close windows because of these two reasons. Also for having, uh, for responding to those occupancy densities that I mentioned earlier, we would need a minimum uh, area of 62, a minimum volume of 200, 205, the height of 3.3. But can, these numbers correspond to 25 students in a classroom, which is the average number in the UK, with one teacher and one teacher assistant. However, if we consider the shortage of space in educational sector, and there is not this possibility for the designer to provide that recommended area, we can increase the height to maintain and the required volume for keeping indoor air quality and ventilation rate. Another aspect that is very important for school designers is considering windows at different levels and at different sizes. So as you can see, these two schools, ventilation rates were much higher than other uh, schools and classrooms. And it was mainly because we had a combination of high and low level openings and a combination of small and large openings. Uh, but how does it help? Um, well, High openings uh, help us to, um, uh, direct the, um, to direct the airflow above the occupied zone, and it prevents cold droughts dumping onto the occupants before mixing with their room air. Also, low-level safe openings can be operated by children, and they can provide local ventilation. And large openings can be used for still summer, summer days to increase ventilation rates, and small openings can be used for winter days to avoid overheating. And uh, at the, although these classrooms are single-sided, however, with uh, different inlets and exit openings at different levels, and by vertical separation of the windows, we have been able to increase the stack flow and ventilation rates. Versus this classroom, um, due to the design, ventilation rate was really poor. Another aspect that can be considered is designing a more accessible and user-friendly controls and windows. So designing through the length of the classroom rather than at the end of the classroom, as you can see in these pictures, the windows are um, located alongside the classroom. Higher number of students can interact with them. It provides a more uniform um, indoor environmental quality and it can be operated by a higher number of them. Versus this classroom, uh, the windows are located at the very end of the classroom. Only teacher can operate them, especially because they are remotely controlled and remotely controlled can only be operated by one person. And um, the indoor environmental quality is not actually very uniform in this classroom because the students sitting close to the windows were feeling cold and students sitting at the very back, they were feeling warm. Uh, regarding um, double-sided windows, if there is this possibility and if the design permits to have windows at two sides of the uh, classroom, it's important to design windows uh, at different heights on opposite facades to facilitate cross ventilation. Another aspect to increase ventilation rate can be supplementing windows with ventilation grids to provide extra ventilation. And as rain was one of the factors that limited window operation, it's important to design windows to not let rain in when it's raining outside. Regarding blinds and shades, um, well, as you can see in these two pictures, installing vertical blinds rather than roller blinds helps really to um, let fresh air in, while by adjusting slats, we can control direct sunlight. So the advantage of vertical blinds is that um, by adjusting the slats, fresh air still can come in. However, with the roller blinds, because of the context that they have, it really blocks airflow and it will decrease ventilation rates. Also, as you can see in this picture, non-operable windows on the top, the blinds on them, they're usually not operated because they're not closed to the operable windows. However, in classrooms where non-operable windows were designed closer to the operable windows just to provide enough daylight, 
their blinds would have been operated more frequently in terms of improving uh, visual environments. Another aspect that was observed was designing external doors onto quiet and private porches. So in this example, you can see that uh, external doors are uh, designed into a private courtyard and uh, it actually um, it brings an element of bioflex design in post-pandemic schools. Um, however, in the schools that the external door was designed to a totally different type of yard, the interaction was less and students would not interact with the nature and the outside door, the outside environment uh, very much. Um, also, because of um, the importance of CO2 level, it's important to equip the primary schools with CO2 warning devices so that when CO2 level uh, gets higher than a certain level, they would um, do an action and open the windows. Uh, for schools maintenance team, um, the recommendations uh, would be really lowering the heating set point temperature to respond to students lower thermal comfort temperature. Uh, previous studies have shown that um, if a student's comfort temperature was used for heating, 12 to 33% of heating energy could be saved. Also, it's important to encourage school occupants to practice both personal and environmental adaptive behaviors, but in an efficient way. So for example, feeling a little bit cold, we can wear a jumper instead of turning on the heating system, instead of turning on the heating system. Also, because with a uh, with the increase in closing flexibility, occupants can adapt to a higher cooling set point and a lower heating set point. It's important to consider that level of uh, clothing flexibility as well for school occupants. Uh, for teachers and students, I think it's very important that they know about the importance of their operations on blinds and controls and windows on indoor environmental quality and energy. Also, teachers need to know about the difference of their thermal comfort temperature with children and children have a lower thermal comfort temperature. It's um, also important to evaluate indoor environmental quality by um, uh, teachers at very short intervals. My study showed that after 30 to uh, 40 minutes, Indoor environmental quality um, is deteriorating, so it's important to reevaluate it again by changing the status of controls. Um, also, it's important to encourage students to engage with window operations if windows are designed safely for them and uh, really express their preferences in terms of thermal environments and indoor air quality and visual environments. Um, also, my study showed that um, when windows were operated during breaks or lunch break, uh, CO2 level could be uh, reduced significantly. So it's important to um, open a window during those periods without compromising children's thermal comfort to clear accumulated CO2 level. Uh, as a summary, I would emphasize on uh, children's lower thermal comfort temperature for really reducing set point temperature and to save energy and to provide a higher level of comfort for them. Higher temperatures would really increase their tiredness level, would decrease their comfort level, and it also waste, is a waste of energy. Um, also, it's important to design the context of the school. Um, the schools that are designed in location where there is a high background noise level and pollution level, operations are limited and restricted. Um, also, private courtyards with green areas uh, helps further interaction of students with outdoor spaces. And designers need to consider the importance of occupancy density to correspond to minimum classroom area and volume that were mentioned yeah, for a classroom uh, with 25 students. Uh, also, in terms of design of windows, it's important to consider different purpose-built uh, openings for both heating and non-heating season. It's important to operate windows as well during heating season to really accumulate CO2 level, to clear uh, accumulated CO2 level and increase ventilation rates. And so high level openings can direct airflow above the occupied zone. Low level safe openings can be operated by children. They can provide local ventilation. Large openings can be used for still summer days to increase ventilation rates. Small openings can be used for winter days to avoid overheating. And generally having different inlet and exit openings at different levels can increase the stack flow by vertical separation of the windows. Also windows needs to be more accessible, user-friendly and um, vertical blinds were preferred over roller blinds. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed it. I pass it back to Rosie. 
Thanks so much, Sevada. That was really interesting. I, I know how much uh, well, how much interest you take in um, indoor environmental quality in schools and 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 pupils' ability to to learn in in a good environment. So, yeah, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and we will we will continue to take your questions in the chat. Thank you for those we've received so far. Do do continue to um, add any more. And we'll now um, pass on to um, Jack Fleming, Associate Director at Hydrock, and Ryan Morton, Principal Mechanical Engineer with Hydrock. Um, they will talk about their practical experience uh, working on school projects, um, the challenges required around designing schools that comply with the DFE standards, uh, whilst navigating compromises um, to address overheating energy usage and daylighting within schools. So we're really, really grateful to, to be joined. Um, and I will pass over to you now. Thanks very much. Um, excuse me if my voice goes a bit weird. I've got a bit of a cold today. So uh, just share my screen and... There we go. Um, yeah, so like 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 Rosie said, we uh, um, uh, Hydrock. I'm 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 Jack. Um, uh, I'm a associate director, um, and uh, I've worked on lots and lots of schools over the past few years. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training. Um, and Brian, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? I hope so. <coughs> Ryan Morton, me mechanical principal. As Jack said, he's um, we're both with Hydrock and working on the schools. He's electrical biased, I'm mechanical biased. Yeah. Um, okay, so we go to the next one. So uh, yeah, as I was even saying, if you've got any questions, please chuck them in the in the chat. We can uh, have a session at the end where we can talk about them. Um, not precious. Don't don't worry about uh, upsetting me. If you think I've said something that's wrong, <laughs> please just <laughs> ask a question. Um, so just a bit of background about Hydrock. Um, we 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 really believe that you know that in building such as schools institutions like that can be a really important for society there's something that we actually take a lot of pride in we we're really passionate about the projects that we do and um we put a lot of extra work in to try and come up with ways to improve and um uh make the designs better suited to the people that are using the buildings um we've got offices um, so I go to this one, offices all over the country. So we, so Ryan and I are based in Bristol. So most of our projects are based in the Southwest. Um, but obviously we've got you know, offices all over the country. So I've, I've worked on, on projects most places um, with the exception of London. So if there's any questions on London plan, I'm afraid I can't answer them. Um, so if we, we crack on. Uh, so there's, there is a pretty set process if you're designing a DfE funded school. Um, the, the document that you need to comply with essentially is called the ALPA specification and it's produced by the Department for Education, who I'll refer to as a DfE from now on. Um, there's a, a, a latest version that's just come out um, in May 2022. Um, that version uh, of the output spec has some, some pretty uh, big changes from the previous, previous um, uh, output specification. The 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 sort of tranche of schools which are going to be designed to this this uh, specification are just sort of become, being released now by the, the department for education so um you will all start to see them sort of rolling out over the next few months um which include these new requirements which i'll just talk about now um the uh it's the so the output specification is 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 broken up into various elements there's a generic design brief which is goes over most parts of the school in, in, in a little bit of detail. Um, and then there's annexes, um, which go into different areas uh, in more detail. So there's one on, on you know, lighting, one on mechanical, uh, et cetera. Um, the, I think that what the DfE are trying to achieve with their output specification is a, a focus on flexibility, because whereas they may have a, a, a trust or, or, a, or an academy that's going to take over the school when it's built now, the DfE want that building to be usable by a different trust and different academy potentially in 10 years time or 15 years time if things change. Uh, so they so whilst they do accommodate a certain amount of individual requirements from from schools, they tend to try and make them as, as sort of flexible and adaptable as possible. Um, the 
it includes lots and lots of compliance for 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 not just the ME services but for the architects and structures and everything as well um an example for um, an M e would be the overheating requirements uh, we've got a designer building that um complies with the 2080 weather file which is a, a, an ex expected increase in temperature of two degrees um and then you have to also um demonstrate that that with with minimal adaptation you can then deal with a plus four degree energy rise hopefully we don't get there that's why we're doing all this but that's what you have to do so it's not just um you know imagine the hottest day in the summer now I had two degrees for that that's actually what we have to to comply with um the daylighting requirements again they are, are quite stringent there's there's two elements i won't go into too much detail but essentially we need to get as much useful light into the into the room as, as possible and cover as much of the space as possible uh useful light is not just as bright as possible there is an upper limit so to minimize glare so it's not just fill the room with glass and, and hope for the best there is a there is an upper limit where the light stops being useful because it's too bright um as a new requirement for the the latest output spec the um the dfe requires uh, any new school to be net zero carbon in use um we'll, we'll talk about all of these in a bit more detail as we go on but essentially that means previously when you had to do a partel compliant uh, design um you would include things like the heating the ventilation the lighting um the cooling um and ignore things that got plugged into sockets like laptops and screens and and, and things like that what we have to do now is we also have to include all of those things that get plugged in so screens laptops you know any it equipment um and get an energy total for the school and then offset that energy using renewables. So with solar panels or wind turbines, probably unlikely wind turbines, but mostly uh, photovoltaic panels, which is what we call them, PV panels. Um, and another requirement for the latest version of the output spec is a cross ventilation. So where you've got a classroom and it's a bit of touched on it, this is, and it's, she's absolutely right. It is, a, is a, can be really beneficial. Where you've got a classroom, which has two external walls, it, it's easy. That's windows openable on two sides. But in most in most schools, you'll have the vast majority of the, the classrooms will only have one ele elevation of, of glazing, in which case you need to then provide a route out of that classroom on the other side into a yeah, there's, there's lots of options, but say into a corridor and then out of the corridor through um, roof vents or, or wall vents. Um, it's a little bit of a diagram here about the sort of what we're trying to achieve if you look at the cross ventilation one essentially imagine the window on the other side was actually a grill going to a corridor and then traveling on further up through the school um internally to outside to give that that passage of air from one side to the other um go on to the next one so when we're designing a school um early decisions can have a massive impact for us um so one of the things that we get involved with um quite uh, soon after concept is the orientation um there's a little diagram here that we've done for a different study where we were trying to sort of demonstrate the ideal orientations just for daylighting uh and as you can see that there's there's certain elevation certain orientations of a school that make it much more difficult for us to pass the daylighting requirements those are the two um uh, factors we have to which is udi and S sda um I won't go. You know, I won't go into too much detail on those, but it, essentially, the the bits that are red, uh, are, uh, using this window window uh, um, setup that we've got, we just you know they're just not gonna not gonna pass. Um, so you are allowed a certain number of the rooms to not pass the daylighting. So twenty percent of the rooms can fail, but on a school that's you know if you've got lots of uh, schools facing north, then you're going to struggle. Um, but on the other hand, you've also got to um, consider the overheating and the energy usage. Um, again, we'll go on through that in a bit more detail as we go on. But um, there's also a consideration for the types of room in each elevation. So if you've got, for example, um, a, a, a theatre or a dark room, which some schools do have, they have no requirement for daylighting. So there's a, there's a list of the output spec which tells you what the requirements for daylighting are for different types of rooms. And obviously the classroom is the one with the highest standard of, of daylighting required. But then there are rooms like um, dark rooms and, and performance spaces, which can which have no real act, uh, requirement for, for daylighting. So if you can design a building so that they're on the side which gets the least daylight, then that 
that is a benefit because it means that they don't take up valuable space on, say, on a south elevation. Um, obviously, there is also, when you get a new school from the DFE, uh, they will have an adjacency uh, diagram, which will tell you which rooms they want next to each other. So you have to consider that. And it's, 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 it's all a very difficult balance at this stage to try and um, get the adjacencies that are required by the school, but also consider the everything that we need to consider. Um, the glazing, obviously, the size and position of the glazing can make a big difference, um, not just for daylighting, but for overheating and for energy use. Uh, again, like I said we'll go on to a bit more detail on that a bit. Um, then the consideration of the geographical location. So if it's very overshadowed shadowed in one part of the site and it's not on the other, another part of the site, say if the, the site might be on a hill, for example, um, consideration about where the site actually is located can not just doesn't just have an, a, you know, an impact on the cut and fill, but also daylighting, overheating, energy, all of these things. So we try and give as much advice as we can because this, this, these decisions have to take place very quickly from when we get, first get involved with the school design because the school design process, if you're following the DFE program, is very quick. So we have to, so we have to sort of mass out the school quite basic in a basic format and just tweak it round and, and do test calculations to see which is the best way uh, to orient it on the site and the best position physically on the site. Again, we, we don't always get what we want because there may be other site factors which are um, limiting where the, the school can be placed. Uh, then there's also another thing to consider when you're talking about, and this is just orientation we we're talking about. So, if, um, air quality and acoustics. So, obviously, there's there are very strict acoustic requirements by the DFE. Much stricter if it's an SEN school. So SEN is a special educational needs school. Um, and so, if there was, say, for example, a very busy road on one side of the site, you want to try and move the building away from that. Um, again, for their air quality, similar consideration. If it's busy road, you want to try and keep it as far away from that as possible, especially with the new. Uh, ventilation uh, building regs come through, which Ryan, I think Ryan will have a talk about in a minute. So Ryan, do you want to run through this slide? Yeah, so this one is is primarily what Jack and I really get involved in. <clears throat> Once the big decisions have been made on your sort of orientations and the massing side of things, adjacencies, it's we've got to then make it work for the users, the occupants, and what the DFE is after at the end of the day. So some of the decisions we'll be looking at are the likes of the window size. A smaller window is great because you can reduce overheating, but in the summer, you don't get as much heat from it through the, through the um, thermal energy from the sun. So this is where we kind of end up having to look at it and go, all right, well, we're on this orientation. You're looking at this amount of sunlight. You can run some very complex models that we won't really get into but it's can we improve, increase the window size to X amount? That means we then don't need heating in the middle of winter when we're actually, when we're getting useful energy from the sun. But then away from that, once you've sorted all your thermal side of things, you've got your daylighting and natural lighting to deal with. As Jack said, the DFE is quite hot on UDIs and SDIs, I think they are. Mm -hmm. So it's how much light can we get in there? That means we don't then need lighting. So we're playing off four factors against each other that we need to allow, but we also want to reduce the, the mechanical or the electrical side of things. It means we can push more towards a net zero in use and not have to put more active systems in. Following on from that, you end up with the likes of the natural ventilation or the mechanical ventilation. Natural ventilation is great, as Seppard has been demonstrating, reduces energy demand, and it actually means that users have more choice on what they can do with it. Do they open one window, two windows, three windows, that type of thing. So they can then get more involved in actually what they're using this room for and how they want to be with it. You know, I personally quite like a cold room. Jack might like it nice and warm. As we're seeing right now, he's got natural ventilation in his house <laughs> with the windows open. But as Jack mentioned, about three weeks ago, the government brought in some new building regulation approved documents. Part F is to do with ventilation on one of them. The biggest change on this is to do with the air quality. And is it viable in certain places, like middle of London, can't really use natural ventilation. 
But most places the DFE are looking for schools now. We've got one up the road from Bristol, up in Thornbury, which is a nice green belt sort of area. Outright, you can use natural ventilation on this because the air quality allows it. So it's not just playing off against certain bits. It is then playing off what the government's expecting as well as the DFE. So that's where the geographical ideas come into it. On We want to be in places where we can reduce the energy and get the natural ventilation in there. So it just helps everyone, really. Mechanically, we're using energy, but we are energy efficient on them. So we can use what's known as mech vent heat recovery. It's just a nice bit of a thermal energy session in it that means that we can recover about 80% of the energy that we put into that heating. So at that point, once the windows are open, we're not losing a lot of heat. So we're not having to heat up the room for the occupants. The biggest thing we want to do is we want to stay away from any form of air conditioning, which means we want to stay away from any point of overheating. As soon as we go with aircon, we're putting a massive impact on the energy usage. So it's all about that natural holistic approach to how can we reduce an energy demand while making it the ideal environment for the children and the user occupants at the end of the day. Next one, Jack. Yep. So, um, like I said, the output specification in, in sort of reference to what Sebad has been talking about um, does actually provide <laughs> a number of limitations on what you can do with windows. Um, so number one, on the, on the first floor of a building or higher, uh, there's limits on how much they'll allow a window to open. Um, and depending on where that window then sits in the, in the buildup of the wall, uh, it can really limit how much ventilation you can actually bring into that space. Um, imagine if there's a big alcove on the outside and you can only open the window 300 mil, then that's barely getting any um, ventilation in from outside. So that's number one. And that's, they do that on the first floor and above because they don't want kids to be able to throw things out or jump out or fall out. Um, and then on the ground floor, they put limitations on how much the windows can open in terms of how much they stick out past the facade of the building. So that if you're walking past, they don't become a, uh, an obstacle. Uh, you can get around that by, uh, you know, putting in barriers uh, either side of a window so that someone wouldn't walk into them. But again, when when you're building a school with a contractor, the cost is always a, a consideration. And they don't like to do that. Um, a normal window uh, under the, the DFE's um, advice can't be left open over, overnight to, to provide uh, night cooling. Night cooling is really useful, especially in the summer as a free way to to sort of get all the hot air out of the building and bring in the, the cooler air from the night time um so that can be avoided that can be provided as long as you say for example uh replace one of the windows with a louvered section um which can then be opened overnight uh and is still secure um but then that will has a negative effects on the daylighting and you can see what the what we're trying to say here uh so then it makes the daylighting more difficult to uh, to achieve um the other thing that which is really uh, well spotted by Sepeda is that CO2 sensors are actually now be generally being included in, in new schools that are being built. Obviously, there's a lot of schools, <laughs> which uh, older schools, which they need to go back and retrofit to. Um, but generally going forward, this is now something that the DFU request. Um, again, with what Sepeda mentioned about um, uh, heating temperatures, the, the, again, the output spec says what temperatures you need to heat spaces to you know classroom they want to get about 21 degrees in the in the winter um so and these are all uh, compliance requirements that you can derogate against the if you're very wary to do that um so the more information and more research like separate as that's done the, the better i think um generally the individual control is only provided to the teacher so they will have a boost um boost mode for the mechanical ventilation in the classroom if they if they deem it necessary if the co2 gets too high um, again, the, the minimum window height is defined. I think that's generally, I think the DFE is uh, uh, sort of thinking behind that is to avoid distraction, um, and, um, make the sort of the window space robust. Um, the more frame, this may seem counterintuitive, but the more frame with the window, that actually the harder it is to achieve a good U value on that window. So obviously now the new values are much, much much tighter u value is essentially the amount of energy that can escape through a building 
um, through a, a thermal element. So imagine if you're heating a space, you want to keep the U value as low as possible. That means the, li the least of that heat is escaping as possible. Um, so if you have lots of different openings in the window, that means more frame, which means the U value could be much more difficult to achieve. Um, Again, that can affect also the air permeability. So at the end of every, and this is considered in the energy uh, calculations, the air permeability is essentially how much air can escape through a building. You want that again to be as low as possible, but the more openings you have, the, the more air space there is for that, for that to be, to, for things to fail, if you like, and that, that air permeability to, to get worse. Um, and they get, get things like the, you know, when you're running a school, you then have to go and check that every window is closed overnight and, and, and again, the bottom line with when doing lots of things con contractors, open windows are more expensive than a non-openable window. So contractors always like to fight against the the number of open windows that they're putting into classrooms. Um, and I'm sort of running a bit of time, so I'm trying to speed up a bit. Um, in a in a school design process, when you're doing it with the DFE, I'm sure most most of you already know this, but the the chem process is client engagement meetings, and essentially you go from a stage one to a stage four in about 12 sessions. So it's a very, very fast moving process. Um, and the, the DFE and the, the, the successful contractor that's building the school define the program. And obviously both of those want the program to be as short as possible so that things get really squeezed for the design team. Um, there is actually a fairly limited amount of scope for innovation due to how prescriptive the output spec is. Um, it may, well, I say that it just means that the innovation is, is a lot harder to achieve because you have to match everything else that the, the DFE require, but you know, there, there is scope, but it's, 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 it's limited. Um, as I said previously, design is always driven by cost and what has or has not been allowed for. Your contractors don't want to pay for things that they haven't allowed for in their original costs. Um, and the, the DFE don't want to pay more for things that they deem to be unnecessary. Um, and as I said at the start, the schools um, are generally designed to be generic and adaptable. Um, like I said, the, you know, the, the school that runs it currently may have their ideas about how they want to run the school, but they may not be the school that's running it in 15, 20 years time when this building will still be there. Um, so one area of the, the, the new, it, it was included previously in the EAP spec, but it's, it's been more of a focus on the, in the new version is the post occupancy evaluation. Um, there was previously a system called iServe, which was managed by the DFE, which was supposed to collect information from uh, completed schools. Um, I've, I've never seen any results from that. So I don't know if that was ever um, really collated and, and prepared for, for contractors and, and designers in a way that was uh, uh, accessible, um, but I've, I've not seen any of it. Um, so what that means is that a lot of contractors are now starting to just do that themselves because it's really useful for a contractor to know how their buildings perform, not just in terms of um, your energy, which is the main one, you know, is the energy that the building is actually using the same as what we predicted? Is the overheating the same as what we predicted as the daylighting as we predicted? But also in, th in terms of things like Seppard has been talking about, in are the, are the users happy? Um, is it too hot, too cold? Um, does the, you know, is it too noisy to, you know, all, all that sort of stuff that um, is really useful for influencing designs you go forward. So now most contractors are doing that themselves. Um, I think one of the thing, key things is that that needs to be shared better across the construction industry. Um, it, it, people seem to, you know, do it for themselves and then silo it off and don't share it, which is, which is not great for collaboration and improving the, the school buildings for the users. Um, there's a lot of information that's created so there's there's lots and lots of meters and and things that are put into new build schools, but very little of it is actually used and uh, sort of evaluated. So that's something that that as you know the DFE, the contractors, the designers need to get better at collecting and evaluating, uh, as well as user surveys. Um, I think the one of the issues is that um, people view that information as being private and are reluctant to share it quite often, which is fair enough. Um, it's it's just figuring out a way to sort of make that information maybe anonymized and accessible. I'm, I'm not sure I'm <laughs> someone else to come up with an idea on, but that's, that's, there's so much that's being created. Very little of it is actually being uh, provided to the, to the, to the industry sector. Um, as we said, people experience the space very differently. So 
you know, one teacher may say it's too hot, another may say it's too cold, but the it's still useful information. Um, and like I said, there it's you know it's it's individual and and psychological a lot of the times um, in terms of how 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 we use for experiences of space. So it's, it's a summary. Um, the app specification can be very prescriptive. Um, it's, it can be quite hard sometimes to, to derogate against an, an element, even if you think that it will actually be an improvement to the building. Um, there, there is not a great deal of scope for innovation. However, there is, you know, if you're very clever, then, then you can work within the confines to come up with innovative ideas. But essentially, the, 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 the specification is trying to push you in a certain direction. Um, there was already a, a number of criteria which were difficult to achieve for the balance of the daylight and the overheating. And now with the net zero carbon requirements, that makes it even more difficult. Um, the designs have to be produced very quickly, um, which essentially what that ends up meaning is that a contractor and a design team may have a, come up with a sort of a design for a type of school that works. And then they try it, then, then you basically iterate on that as you go forward rather than starting from scratch each time, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, it, it means that certain design decisions get made once and then don't get looked at again. Um, and then, like I said, the post occupancy evaluation results need to be shared among the industry, I think, a lot better than they are currently. So that is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack and Ryan. Um, really enjoyed listening to that um yeah really useful to have your insight um on how it works within school buildings your your practical experience um so we'll jump straight into um some some questions um so uh we've got a question from darren um how realistic is installing climate resilient spaces without the install of air condition conditioning given current climate warming predictions? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the challenge. Um, the, the calculations that we carry out um, prove that, you know, as long if, if you're clever with the space, um, you know, you use, you know, orientate it in the right way, uh, use the right fabric, you can uh, design a, a building that can, can deal with the, the increase in temperature um, and not, exceed the the overheating targets set by the um the, the department for education what i should caveat that with is that if it's if you're not putting air conditioning in a room it's 28 degrees outside it's going to be 28 degrees inside so but what the the compliance that we need to achieve states is that you're allowed to go above a certain temperature for a certain portion of the year um and it's still acceptable so it's not saying that it's going to be between 18 and 21 the entire year, that's not possible without um, uh, air conditioning. Um, what it's saying is that they, have, you know, the the um, SIBSI have, have, have set certain uh, criteria that allow you to uh, get to a certain temperature for a certain portion of the year and they do that as acceptable, uh, but yet it's, it's not going to ever be uh, within a, you know, within the temperature band. If it's, it's 35 degrees outside, it's going to be 35 inside. And Ryan, if you've got anything to... No, I think you covered that. It's, um, <clears throat> I should say, when it's 28 outside and you open a window, it's more than likely going to get to 28 inside. Now, you can also take into account your thermal mass of the building. So just because it is 28 outside and it might be, you might still be increasing your internal temperature from 16 overnight. So that's where our night purge really comes into it. And with the thermal mass of the building being lower, the user occupants will feel low because of radiated temperature. If, say, we're talking about external being less than 28, or sorry, it's 28 outside, we're 21 inside, we've got mechanical ventilation or a combination of that in a mixed mode, the heat recovery units with inside can gain useful cool energy. So they, they effectively cool down the, the incoming temperature. So it's not just a clear cut solution anymore. We've now got to the point where everything's getting quite smart and quite useful that we can look to use what we already have and other passive measures to mitigate the need for an AC. So someone else has already said regarding um, solar shading, the sun is the biggest thing that we get heat from in the summer. That sun coming through the windows, if you can mitigate some of that while still getting your useful light, suddenly you don't need to put in the AC because you've got rid of what is effectively 
a quarter of your heating load when you don't want it. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to another question. Um, this question came in during your presentation, Sister. Um, was any consideration taken on the age of the building, the leakiness of the fabric, amount of glazing within the space, depth of the rooms, etc.? Uh, yes, sure. So, uh, yes, factors related to glazing and the ratio between glazing and room area, the depth of the room in a proportion to the windows and glazing, and also glazing to classroom ratio, depth to height ratio, these were considered. And uh, for classifying classrooms based on their potentials for providing natural ventilation and how effective they are in terms of providing adequate indoor air quality, these classifications were considered. Um, in terms of uh, the time of their construction, that again, I considered them in terms of uh, another category and another classification, but leakness of the fabrics, no, that wasn't a factor that I considered. And it was because at the time it was very difficult in terms of equipment to measure that factor. Um, but factors that were significantly and directly affect, uh, affecting ventilation rates. They, those were considered and um, helped me in terms of classifications and categorizing classrooms. Thank you. Um, we are running out of time, but um, uh, just another, I think we've got time for one more question. So um, a question from Claire Pre Pierce, uh, for Jack and Ryan, how useful would it be to use research like Cepheda's to influence government policy um, or the requirements from DfE? Oh, very. This, I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that that needs to, you know, be published and uh, sort of uh, demonstrated to the Department for Education because I think what they do is, you know, they they add a bit onto the specification every year. Uh, and then perhaps there's things that were were put in there five six years ago, which they've just accepted and kept in there, which need to be relooked at. Um, and so this sort of information is particularly when we're trying to achieve the energy targets. We are if we could reduce the the energy, you know, the, the heating temperature of a classroom in winter from 21 to 18 or or 17. That doesn't seem like much. That's a massive amount of energy that you can save, and it would then mean that it's a lot easier to achieve the rest of the the, the um, energy the compliance targets um, without potentially having to um, reduce the scope of the building elsewhere so we may at the moment we may be telling a school that okay you can only plug in two pcs into, in this classroom um, if we could reduce the set temperature then we could say okay well now you can have 10 you know it's it's that's the kind of stuff that that can change and that's the balance that you can make so yeah there's really really important that um, this kind of research is done and shared. Yeah, just to jump on that, I've done a very quick calc and by dropping your temp, your set point two or three degrees, you can reduce the room's heating load by about 15% per classroom. So if you do that over numerous classrooms, suddenly you don't need another, let's take a boiler for an example, you don't need another one or you don't need an air source heat pump. So you've reduced your energy demand drastically by doing what is very little. No, it's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious of time and that, that everyone will have things they need to move on to, um, perhaps lunch. Um, so we'll thank everyone so much for joining us. Um, thank you to Jack Fleming and Ryan Morton from Hydrock. And of course, thank you, Septo for uh, presenting your research. It's been really interesting. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. And you can stay in touch with us about future events through the Low Carbon Devon um, LinkedIn page. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. All. Thank right. you.